we're all going through some struggles of isolation and cabin fever. So uh, thank you so much for sending out your cards last week and making, continuing to make phone calls to your friends and family. I know, I know some of you sent cards and notes and they're making a huge difference. I'm curious if you'll let me know what reaction you get from the notes and the scripture that you send out, but keep doing it. It's making a big difference. What new struggle are you encountering in this isolation? Maybe your struggles are practical in nature. I listened to an interview with Jeannie McManus this uh, past week, and I wonder if her struggles are something you might be familiar with. She said every day for her is like the food show Chopped, where they give the chef a basket with four ingredients and say, make something with this. She says she looks in her cabinets and she's got four ingredients, cotton candy, chicken livers, uh, wheat germ, and celery root. She says she has to make something from that. She's trying to get by with just the bare essentials and not leave her house any more than what she has to. Maybe you're kind of experiencing that. She also said she's baking bread for the first time in 50 years. <laughs> None of us seem to know what to eat at home and we're try, try, probably getting tired of our own cooking and yet we're all gaining weight. Maybe your struggle during the isolation is deeper and more difficult than that though. Are you battling fear or worry? Or does anxiety top your list? I know some of you were already battling those feelings and thoughts, and being isolated probably hasn't helped. Have any of you encountered intimidation or threats because you are a Christian? It hasn't happened in our state, but I think it has happened in other states. One of my preacher friends said that the people he ministers to and works with as a missionary in Honduras their community is really struggling. They're only allowed to leave their homes on assigned days, and they've been given assigned numbers on when they can go to the market to buy food. Whatever your struggle, I want to encourage you with the Word of God today. And the encouraging word I want to give you comes from the book of Revelation. Go on and get your Bibles out and turn to Revelation chapter 1. I think this is maybe the most opportune time for us to study the book of Revelation. One reason is because anytime there are struggles or sickness or death, people start wondering, are we in the end times? And Revelation has an answer for that question, though it may not be what you think. And when we experience sickness and death, it can have a sobering effect on our thought process. When we're not distracted by sports and we finally get bored with Netflix, we begin to look around and see what, what is going on in the life around us. And we slow down long enough to think about these more intense questions. We come back to that one overarching question. Why do bad things still happen to God's people? And Revelation actually has an answer to that question as well. It even tells us how to respond when those bad things happen to us. An even better reason to study Revelation is, is that this letter assures Christians of the ultimate victory of God and God's people over the powers of evil and death. In John 16, Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And Revelation is a letter about Jesus overcoming the world. We need that reassurance of Jesus Christ today, and if not right now, then His Word will prepare us for the day that is coming when we will need it. The revelation of Jesus Christ is given to the prophet John is just what we need. Some people say, but isn't Revelation complicated, confusing, and intimidating? Yes. All of Scripture works this way. Some parts of Scripture are complicated, and some parts are confusing, and some parts of Scripture we have to be honest and admit we don't understand at all. But the important parts that God wants us to understand are really, really clear. And Revelation works like that too. Some parts are confusing and complicated, but the important parts that God wants us to use and be comforted by our crystal clear. Revelation teaches us how to respond when we encounter struggles that are beyond our control. In the first chapter, the Apostle John lays out two reminders that give the Christians both comfort and hope in the midst of conflict. And these two reminders that his readers in the first century needed are the same two reminders that we need. The two reminders that bring hope and comfort in our struggle is the reminder of who we are and who we worship. First, who we are. Knowing our identity is important. In fact, knowing our 
our identity actually gives us purpose and direction. Knowing our identity can act like a compass, giving us direction when the circumstances are swirling and unrelenting and confusing all around us. The Christ follower is the, in the first century definitely had confusing and uncomfortable circumstances. I like to say what they had was a very rude environment. R-U-D-E. Rude. The R is for Roman persecution. Under the emperors of Rome, the Christians had been attacked, exiled, and killed. Emperor Domitian, the one in charge during the writing of Revelation, and the one who exiled John to the island of Patmos, isolating him away from his family, his church, and his community, and Domitian, who made everyone call him Lord and God, was one of those leading the attacks. The U is for upheaval in family dynamics. Most Christians, after the resurrection of Christ, had Jewish families, and with the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and the turning to Jesus as Savior, a lot of Jewish families had disowned their Christian brothers and sisters. The D is for doctrine. But it's in this case, in John's community, in the first century, they were faced with false doctrines that had been popping up ever since Christ rose from the dead. And one of the biggest heretical doctrines John and the church he ministered to faced was the false doctrine that Jesus never came in the flesh, but only appeared to suffer and die in some kind of vision form. And E is for ecclesia. Ecclesia is the gathering of Christians that was later incorrectly translated as the word church. John was very concerned for the Christians he helped teach and guide, his community of believers. And John wanted his congregations to be safe from harm, strong in confidence, and secure in their faith. But the attacks from the Roman government, the shunning from their families, and the false teachings that penetrated their thought process and could spread so quickly had put the church in danger. Do any of those first century problems sound anything like our problems? Do we ever encounter government opposition to following Christ? Well, maybe in some ways. Do we ever get shunned by our families? Well, I say, yeah, sometimes. One of my uh, past friends from Israel is named Yoel, and he was shunned by his family when he and his wife committed their lives to Christ. His grandmother, when she found out, took out a full pad age in the local paper and put her grandson's, Yoel's face, on that page and named him and said he was as bad as Hitler for following Jesus. Do we ever encounter false teachings? Yeah, I, I think we do all the time. Have you ever uh, encountered the internet? <laughs> That's why it's so important for Jesus to remind his followers who they were. And he does so in the very first chapter of Revelation. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. Here's what he says. To the seven gatherings, ecclesia, in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Christians are remade to be kingdom and to be a kingdom and priests that serve God. This is the first reminder of who we are. One teacher said that every sentence in Revelation can be traced back to a reference either in the Old or New Testament. And this reference to the kingdom of priests can be traced all the way back to Exodus chapter 19 when Moses was leading the Israel out, Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land. In Exodus chapter 19, let me turn over there. In Exodus chapter 19, God spoke to Moses from the mountain to explain who his people were and who they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do. Exodus chapter 19 verse 3 says this, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him to him from the mountain, and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession." Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. 
in that chapter of Exodus, God gives this phrase, kingdom of priests, and it's a really important phrase. The role of the priest is to mediate between or connect two parties, holding one hand here and holding the other hand here and then bringing them together. Because the Jews were now a kingdom, an entire nation of priests, their role was to connect someone to God. They were supposed to hold God's hand and connect someone to God. The only other someones around were the other nations. Israel's role was to connect other nations to Yahweh, their God. And they were to connect the other nations by bearing witness to what they saw God do and how He had led them to the promised land. That role is described as a witness in Scripture. Experience and see God and then tell others what you have seen and heard. Jesus knows we need to be reminded that this is our role too. This can be especially difficult to remember when we encounter struggle. When we hurt or get scared, we tend to draw in on ourselves in self-protection mode instead of continuing on the path of our true purpose. So Jesus reminds the Christians in John's time they are his priests, and their identity gives them purpose. They are still supposed to connect people to God by bearing witness to what they've seen and experienced. That role is passed down through the generations of followers all the way to us. Our purpose is defined by our, our identity, and we are a kingdom for God. Christ's followers are his nation of priests. And we need to be reminded of what is important. Everybody does. I heard about a grandmother this past week, this past Easter, who loved to give her grandkids gifts. But the last several years, she's been blessed with even more grandchildren, and buying each one of them a gift has gotten to be too much of a hassle. So this past Easter, last Sunday, she decided to send each, of, each one of her grandchildren a check for cash and a note that said, this year, buy your own gift. Just a couple of days ago, she noticed on her desk where she had written the letters, a pile of checks that she had forgotten to include in her notes. All her grandkids got was a note that said, this year, buy your own gifts. We, we still need to be consistently reminded of what is most important. And for some of us, this is a renewed purpose. For some of us, this is the first time we have ever heard that we have a purpose in the kingdom of God by carrying out our role as priests. We are to experience God and then tell others what we have experienced. We bear witness for Him, connecting others to Him by our words. One church planter said, Historically, we've always thought of evangelism, that bearing witness part, as done with our feet and our faces. We go and we tell. But people today don't seem to mind listening to electrons and seeing avatars. Right now, you can be friends in other cities and other nations that you have never personally met, and you can bear witness about Jesus Christ over the internet in extraordinary ways. We can share Jesus around the world on our computers or our phones or our Twitter accounts or on TikTok or Instagram or on Facebook. Whatever social media platform you use, uh, Peter reminds us to use to give a response for the reason we have hope. And this past Sunday, if you joined us online for our Easter sermon and Easter worship, we may have participated in the largest witness for Jesus Christ and His resurrection in the history of the world because millions of people were online sharing devotions and thoughts and praise and bearing witness for what they've experienced in Jesus Christ. Some people will reach millions via the internet, but Christ is just calling to us to do enough to reach one. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest field. And later in John, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. People are hungry for the word of what we have, too. Global media outreach and evangelistic organizations said that they make 200 million gospel presentations online every year. But in mid-March to late March of this year, there was a 170% increase in their search engines about finding hope. 
Ads for how to deal with fear were up 57%, and ads on how to deal with worry were up 39%. And there was a 16% increase in gospel presentations this past March compared to last March. That makes 12.4 million presentations about the good news this past March. And they're not the only online organization bearing witness about Jesus. Now, your platform, your Facebook likes may not spike to 12.4 million, but you can still witness to at least one. Put a witness, put a message about Jesus in your answering machine on your cell phone. Or perhaps when you answer your calls, maybe say, the Lord Jesus Christ is great. This is Dale. Of course, use your own name, not mine. And all those numbers you ignore because you don't recognize that number, and you know they're probably just trying to scam you into buying a fake warranty for your car, answer the call. Go on and answer it. Say no to the warranty and yes to witnessing. Be a disruptive witness. And by that, I don't mean argumentative or mean-spirited. I'm talking about how Alan Noble says we are to be disruptive by our grace and love. A witness that testifies to the radical, exclusive transcendence of God and invites our neighbors to wrestle and contemplate the gospel. Not as an opinion, but invite them to contemplate it as truth. Put a salutation on the end of your email and witness for the Lord. One of our elders, Jake Green, is a school teacher in our local school system. He has an automated response at the end of each of his emails that says, And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Hebrews 13, 16. See, he's witnessing just by using email. All of my emails just end with, sent from my iPhone. When we start being able to meet again, you can invite groups of three or four families into your home for a meal. And you can pray with them and you can read scripture with them. But in the meantime... We get to get online and invite others into an electronic discussion about the struggles they are facing. The pandemic is a perfect opportunity to talk about questions of life and liberty and death, obedience to authority, submission, and even sacrifice. And remember, you're not called to convince or argue. You're just called to witness. Use the internet internet to bear witness. People are there. People are reading it, and people believe that it's real. It's real life. Do this. To do this, you have to be fearless, but you also have to be kind and gentle too. Invite people to think about what you say and invite them to respond. Don't just try to win an argument. I, I don't always get this right. I've tried to win too many arguments online, but sometimes I do get it right. And one of the greatest compliments I've ever received on Facebook from an unbeliever was that she thought I acted like the online Mr. Rogers. See, we are here to be God's witnesses no matter what, because we're called to be his priests. And we can witness without fear, and we can live without fear, even in struggles or persecution, because of the second reminder Revelation chapter 1 gives us. The second reminder is who we worship. Jesus reveals who we worship, and here it is. We worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is God and Lord and ruler of the universe. Go to verse 12 of chapter 1. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands, is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
This is the word of the Lord. And we can be so thankful for this word. This vision of Jesus, this vision of Jesus frightened John so much that he fell like a dead man. I think John expected to turn around and see the Jesus he had walked with and had seen resurrection, re- resurrected. But he turns around and he sees the glorified Christ as God. All through scripture, we hear and see that we worship one God. And our one God reveals himself as three in one. God the Father, who no one can see. Jesus the Son, who is made visible and comes in the flesh to earth. And then ascended back to heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And the Holy Spirit, which is described in Revelation as the sevenfold or seven spirits of God. But here in a vision... Like no other, the lines between the three persons are blurred, and we see that Jesus is God. John sees Jesus as he really is, a priest, pure and holy and purifying, set on a firm foundation, speaking powerful truths as the light of the world. First, the Son of Man is a phrase that has its origins in Daniel chapter 7. And as Tom Howard wrote, Jesus is not here pictured like a pale Galilean John knew, but a towering and furious figure who will not be managed. Even stronger than the image we have from the Lord of the Rings, where the gray wizard Gandalf yells and stamps his staff, You shall not pass! This vision of Jesus could easily and literally stomp Gandalf out of existence. There Jesus is, standing and identifying with his church, his lowly people, walking among us, the golden lampstands, the ecclesia, holding us up and supporting and protecting us by his mighty right hand. And the first thing John notices that he points out to us in this vision of his is his clothing. The clothing defines the role of Christ. The garments John sees are the priestly garments, a royal priest's robe and sash. Jesus is our high priest, and as priest, he presents us to God and God to us. He's a bridge between the divine and human, and this is why in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus starts his vision to John with the words about witness. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus fulfills the role of chief witness, sharing what he has seen and heard and experienced to save those who trust in him. Next we see his white hair and his blazing eyes. The white represents purity, and he is pure, holy beyond measure. No stain nor darkness or sin of any kind can creep in and dirty that sparkling white. He is so pure that he destroys darkness as it approaches. And his flaming eyes are penetrating and purifying. You know, fire consumes. It burns off the dross and leaves only what is pure after the fire passes. And as we stare intently at Jesus and we grow closer to him in our character, He is carefully killing every shadow we have left within us, making us more and more like him, pure and holy. Next, his feet are described like burnished bronze, newly fired and refined in the furnace. They're glowing hot and stable and strong. This is in contrast to the feet that were weak and brittle and crumbling in Nebuchadnezzar's dream from Daniel chapter 2. The vision Jesus gives us is where he is walking around our gatherings, the ecclesia, the churches, on a base that is strong and firm, and his foundation of power truly has been tested by fire. One preacher put it this way, Iron is strong, but it rusts, and copper won't rust, but it can be bent. But when we combine the two into bronze, we get the best quality of each, the strength of iron and the endurance of copper. This is, the first, this is the foundation of truth that Jesus brings everywhere he walks. Next, John describes the sound of his voice and the sword from his mouth. The sound of his voice is awesome and commanding, and the words cut through straight to the heart, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, marrow even revealing the attitudes of our hearts. That's the sword that comes out of his mouth, the word of the Lord, the scripture of truth. And in his right hand, he holds ready to use, not a sword, but ministering angels. Christ does not come with the sword in this picture, but he comes with messengers ready to be deployed. 
Jesus has always used his angels, his messengers, to witness for him. This is how he conquers. He conquers with his message given by his witnesses. And just like when Moses met with God, and afterwards his face shone with the absorbed light from God's presence, Jesus' face was like the sun shining in full strength. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'd like to read a passage that describes the change that happened to John after he saw the vision of Christ from the book Reverse Thunder, The Revelation of John and the Praying Imagination. Here is about a page and a half from this book. Prior to the vision, John is on the prison island in isolated exile. He's cut off from his churches by a decree out of unholy Rome. Rome is the ascendant power. The gospel has been proved a weak and ineffective sally against unstoppable evil. Two generations after the euphoria of Pentecost, it is thoroughly discredited. Everything John has believed and preached is, to all evidence, a disaster. And then, without a single thing having happened in Rome or in Asia, no earthquake to change the face of the earth, and no revolution to change the government in Rome, John is on his feet. He has a message. He has a job. He has a means for bringing God home to the people and the gospel to the world. The difference between St. John the prisoner and St. John the pastor is Christ in vision and in reality. John, away from his churches, fretting from lack of intimate knowledge of his people, sees the penetrating, attentive eyes of his Savior. And John, weak from confinement, sees the strong, burnished feet of his Lord. And John, used to speaking with authority to his apt to stray sheep, but now without voice, hears the, authorita the authoritative voice of the ruler of church and world. John, homesick for his congregations, sees them held in the right hand of the shepherd of Israel. John, at the mercy of the political sword of Rome, sees the word of God proceeding sword-like and not returning void. John, nearing the end of his days, the energy of his continents in eclipse sees the presence of a radiating Christ throwing blessing on all. By virtue of the vision, the crushed exile becomes a vigorous prophet. In time of crisis, he receives a fresh visitation from God which delivers the people from oppression. Visions, if they are truly visions and not wish-fulfilled dreams, makes things happen. St. John exiled is now St. John empowered. The poet writes, In dreams begins responsibility, but in visions are born realities. How big is your vision of Christ? Can this vision be our reality? The writer of Revelation certainly hopes so, and Jesus hopes so too. I hope so. Would you pray to make Jesus as big as the vision given to us in your own life? Would you pray to see Jesus as he really is, our God made flesh? And would you use the vision of Christ given to us to propel you into action of being his witness? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this vision that John gives us of Christ, who we worship. And I thank you for the reminder of who we are in his kingdom. Would you allow now in our hearts and in our minds the vision to permeate each thought and to change us from the inside out so that we would be energized to witness for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're not going to use your voice or platform or social media account to bear witness for Jesus, then you can help the people who do use their voice. It's okay. Some people are more gifted at bearing witness than others. But if you use your gifts to help those who are texting and recording and speaking clearly, then you become part of the kingdom of priests that bring people and connect people to God. So, one of the ways is to help the voice and the word and the witness get out is to continue to give to your local church. If you're a member of our church, continue to give here. You've done such a great job in this isolation period of time, and I want to encourage you to continue to give consistently. 
And everybody understands if you have to give less because your money is tighter these days or you're struggling to pay bills. We have other brothers and sisters in our congregation who are not struggling financially and already are considering giving a little bit more and sacrificing a little bit more so that they can so that we can continue to keep reaching people with the gospel, covering over where others have had to give less. Remember, it's not so much about the amount you give, it's about learning to be consistent with your giving and then over time to, to develop your faith, trust in God, and learn to increase your generosity. Beyond giving to your local congregation, you can also give locally. In our community, Your Father's Kitchen has been continuing to feed people in our community and the homeless in our community during these isolation orders. They're following social distancing guidelines and are still able to feed hundreds of people in our community every week. They've been making deliveries and they've been all over the county driving meals and groceries to people who need food. When they help people in need, they bear witness for Jesus Christ. So if you're able, the next time you go out to get your essential uh, stores and grocery items, will you pick up either canned vegetables or canned fruit or maybe even a, a case of water for your father's kitchen? If, if we can help them with a case of water, then they can continue to bear witness to people that you and I may never get an opportunity to meet. You can drop off the cases of water or canned fruit on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday between 5 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. And, and finally today, we also need to bear witness of Jesus Christ to ourselves and to our families. And one of the ways that we do that is through communion. Would you go on and get out your bread and your juice to use for your time of communion? This week, I, I get to use these saltine crackers. <laughs> I can't open the package. These saltine crackers and this juice box. We just try to have bread and juice. Communion is this great way to witness to ourselves and to our families. The bread reminds us about what Christ did on the cross, sacrificing himself in our place to remove our guilt and pay our penalty for sin. He did this because all have sinned, but he had not. So he took our place and he also did this because he loves us. Would you tell God thank you and eat the body of Christ? And the cup is the witness of the blood that was poured out for Christ's body and now covers over all of our sins, making us white as snow, pure by the purifying fire of the crucifixion. Take and drink the cup, remembering Jesus' blood shed for you. Let's pray. God, we praise you and thank you for the sacrifice of Christ purifying our hearts, making us pure and guilt-free before you. You've declared us not guilty. Lord, we thank you for that new judgment on us, that there's no condemnation for us, and, and thank you for allowing us to remember that in the body and blood of Christ through communion. Lord, now continue to propel us into action as your witnesses. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In our introduction, in our conclusion of worship, we offer an invitation. If you would like to know Christ more, if you want to know him even better, would you make your commitment to Christ or your desire known publicly? Put it into the chat comments, give us an email or even give us a call. You can even text our phone number um, with the word connect and that will connect you with someone who can talk to you about um, what decision you want to make. That's our invitation, that you would recognize who Christ is and that he would be as big as the vision he gave John. And before we go, I wanna let you know that I'll be running a study on Revelation tonight, Sunday night. It's an introduction to the book of Revelation. We go into a little bit more depth on what some of the symbols mean and the things that we can understand. I did this introduction class last Wednesday on Zoom, and I'm just figuring out how to teach online, and apparently last Wednesday all I did was yell into the microphone. So I'm going to run the same class again this Sunday night at 7 p.m. 
And you can join in too, but I need to send you the private text invite for you to join in the Zoom room. You can ask me through Facebook or send me a text or let me know right now in the chat on our webpage or online uh, in our Facebook connection. And remember that online connection card. If you would text the word CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, to 937-382-0904, we'll can, we can get you started on the study of Revelation this Sunday night. I look forward to worshiping with you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure you click on the Connect card and someone will be in touch with you about taking your next best step. And also make sure to check out uh, the resource page uh, where you can continue to give uh, toward the work uh, that the church is doing. Again, we have ministries and missions that are continuing in the midst of this pandemic and you can be a part of the work uh, through giving online. Also check out wcconline.org slash resources for some great children's ministry activities to do this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week.